Hello and good evening, everyone. We're so glad you can be here with us this evening for this presentation of South Village Italian American Support for the Arts with Mary Brown. Before we get started, we'll just do a quick introduction if you're not familiar with village preservation and some Zoom protocols. Right now, the chat is free and open, so please go ahead and drop in where you're tuning in from. We love to know where everybody is watching from this evening. But if you are unfamiliar with Village Preservation, just a quick introduction of who we are. We were founded in 1980, and we work to document, celebrate, and preserve the special architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. We've secured landmark designation for over 1,250 buildings, and we've also secured zoning protections for over 100 blocks, and we host over 75 free programs like this throughout the entire year. This evening is actually our capstone event for 2023, our final event for this year. Now we are a membership organization, so you will see that QR code there on your screen. Take your smartphone, scan it, and then you will be able to become a member. Membership helps make all of this possible and helps us present these programs and keep them free as well. And a membership will make a great last minute holiday gift as well. Now this capstone event this evening is part of our new initiative at Village Preservation where we're making December South Village Month. We kicked off this campaign to honor, document, and seek landmark designation for the South Village all the way back in December 20, 2006 and completed that effort on December 13th, 2016. And that was with the designation of the third and final phase of the South Village Historic District which was the largest landmark protection in the neighborhood since 1969. So these are some, these historic districts are some of the city's first and only historic districts to honor immigrant and artistic history. So that's why we're very excited to present this event this evening as part of our South Village Month for the rest of December. So please make sure you go down, visit the area as well. Sullivan Thompson Historic District last week, we had our shop and stroll there. Go down, visit, see all the beautiful architecture in the shops in the district. Now to introduce this evening's guest. Dr. Mary Brown first spoke to Village Preservation all the way back in spring 2005. She works as an archivist at the Center for Migration Studies which has a mission of it, which is a mission of the Scalabrini fathers who are also active in the village at Our Lady of Pompeii Parish. She teaches writing and US history as an adjunct as Marymount Manhattan College. She received her doctorate from Columbia University and her dissertation was on Italian Catholic immigrants in the Archdiocese of New York. Her next publication will be a new in will be in a new field co-authored with Dr. Christine Angel of St. John's University in Queens. And this will be building representative archives, training archivists to act as the representative inclusive bridge between archive and the public, which is a fascinating subject. She's also authored for Village Preservation, the report and the study, The Italians of the South Village. So welcome, Dr. Brown. Very excited to have you join us. I will now stop sharing my screen and disappear in the shadows and let you take over here. Oh, Dr. Brown, you're on mute. Just, just please unmute yourself. Mute. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Is that working? Perfect, loud and clear. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Okay, let's try another button. Let's try the one that goes slideshow. And let's try the one, slideshow, slideshow. And let's try the one that goes from current slide. Slideshow. From current slide. Oh, come on, little fella. Nope, that didn't work at all. Okay, slideshow from from beginning. 
Resume slideshow. How's that sound? There. Is that better? Everyone see something big and pink with a person in the middle? Perfect. You're good to go. Okay, great. Um, thanks an awful lot. Thanks for your patience with the technology. The last time I was here, I ventured into a new area for me, theater history, introducing the papers of the late 20th century avant-garde dance and theater critic, William B. Harris, held at Marymount Manhattan College. Now I'm back to pick the brains of this highly engaged audience on another topic or series of topics, which I'm calling South Village Italian American Support for the Arts. But that's the picture uh, from my previous talk, just so you can kind of connect me from the last time for those of you who are regulars here. Um, one reason for this talk is that the literature that's in print on this subject of the South Village and Italian Americans and the influx of people who were in the creative community suggests that there was some distance between the two of them. Um, this is kind of the standard work on the field and some of you may be familiar with it. Sociologist Donald Caraco's um, 1984 participant observer uh, work on Soho, Soho's Italian Americans reaction to uh, the artists who began moving in to the loft buildings in the area back before that was legal and then how then it became legal and then the, the artists began to organize themselves to you know protect that their new living space and develop their new living space and work you know create a community for themselves and you know, obviously became a permanent fixture and the Italians had to reckon with that. And that's what the book is about. Um, this book here, Folk City, is a more recent work, uh, 2015. It's based on an exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York. And among the topics it covers is the Battle of Washington Square, that's what they call it, in which folk singers jammed around the Washington Square fountain, jam being the, the, the music, you know, the singing, not, not crowding, uh, music singing on Sunday afternoons to the delight of musicians and students and tourists and to the dismay of local residents, including Italian Americans trying to get some peace and quiet on park benches. And then there's a clash between the two of them and the result, you know, was was ended up actually with uh, with you know more folk singing. Anyway, those were the those two books detail a lot of conflict, if you will. But there are other possibilities, and I wanted to identify them and try to see if there was any evidence for them. And that's why I wanted to speak to you all. And so the first thing I did was just do a little brainstorming and think, well, what else? could happen. It's possible that the Italian Americans didn't notice the creative community much, but the creative community noticed them and took some inspiration from them. And another possibility is that over time, immigrants and their descendants integrate into American culture. And since the creative community is the American culture around them, they integrate into that community. A third possibility is the two communities are side by side, each with their own ideas about what constitutes art. A fourth possibility is a kind of symbiosis, that the two communities are in interaction with each other in some way. So we've got these four possibilities, and now let's look and see if we've got evidence for any of these interactions. One obvious form of interaction is the idea of inspiration. It's the oldest one, the easiest one to find if you go back far enough. Um, during the earliest period of creative people moving into the village, the 1890 to World War I period, the Bohemian period, if you will, there's sporadic examples of Italians providing inspiration for members of the creative community. This is John Sloan's painting of an Italian procession marching not only under the arches of electric lights, 
but in the shadow of an ele in the shadow of um, an elevated train and a row of tenement houses. The band is just passing by, followed by the banner of the saint being honored. That's the purple uh, purple item there. Then come the women and children dressed in white, carrying white candles lit in honor of the saint. Uh, John and Dolly Sloan lived on Perry Street, and John Sloan had a studio in the triangular building that's where Sixth Avenue uh, crosses uh, Cornelius Street. And he painted in various locations around the village, kind of on plein air, but not you know, like painting in nature, painting, you know, street scenes. The village had uh, two parishes near his studio, Our Lady of Pompeii, um, and which is not, when he knew it, it wasn't where it is now, and I'll get into that in a moment, and St. Anthony of Padua, which the building itself is where it was, but the street has changed a little bit. Houston Street's been widened, so it, it's kind of come down closer to St. Anthony's than he would have been familiar with. But neither of them have had many processions of this type. Still, Sloan would have been able to see such processions as mutual benefit societies also held them. A mutual benefit society was an organization usually formed among Italians from the same place in Italy. In the absence of modern life insurance, their club charged dues that unfortunate members who passed away would have their funerals paid for by the club, not by their struggling families. The organization also gathered for an annual observance of the feast day of the hometown patron saint. It was sort of another way of protecting the members spiritually as well as, you know, in practical, you know, this world terms. And that's the event that Sloan captures here. And yeah, the, the colors are a little odd on this one. Um, but the picture does come from the museum that holds it, the San Diego Museum of Art. Uh, here's a more subtle example of Sloan taking some inspiration from the Italian community. And I wanted to use this one because the painting's called Carmine Street Theater, and it was executed in 1913. The theater stood at the corner of Bleecker Street, where Our Lady of Pompeii Church stands today. So this what you're looking at was demolished in the uh, mid 1920s uh, when much of the village was rearranged for uh, the, to extend 6th Avenue, extend 7th Avenue and Barrack Street further south to accommodate modern automobile traffic. Um, as you can see, it seems to be a residential building on the top. You might, I don't know if you've got some uh, zoom tools up there but if you don't there's going to be some bricks and windows up there um as you can see there's it seems to be a residential building with a ground floor fitted for a theater it's closed at the moment with the children uh some of them peeping in at where the posters are it's an operational theater there's trash waiting to be collected out front uh the nun about to cross the front of the picture is in the habit of a Sister of Charity Palatine. You can pick out the collar and the bonnet, the bonnet and veil combination there. Um, at that time, those sisters staffed two missions in the area, a nursery at Our Lady of Pompeii on Downing Street. Our Lady of Pompeii itself was where Sixth Avenue crosses Bleecker today and the St. Raphael Society for the Protection of Italian Immigrants at 8-10 Charlton Street, where they supported the work of the Scalabrini Fathers, who went out to Ellis Island to assist immigrants and sometimes brought the immigrants back to the shelter. They would uh, um, have to sign them all out from the Ellis Island have to agree that they would not let them out to become public charges. Um, uh, but they would bring them to the uh, to this shelter to offer more efficient assistance rather than have them stay on Ellis Island. In the early 1920s, when the city extended Sixth Avenue and Varick Street to get the automobile traffic going to the planned Holland Tunnel, it led to the destruction of many buildings in the area, including the old Pompeii Church, the nursery, the St. Raphael building, and it led to the Palatine sisters moving elsewhere. Okay, 
Another obvious form of interaction is the integration of the two communities. The idea that Italian Americans in the neighborhood would, as they grew up, as their children grew up and speak English and, you know, go to school here and so forth, would, you know, just join in with other things they see around them, including the arts. So far, about the only time I've really run into this was when I was uh, studying, a, I did a history of Our Lady of Pompeii once upon a time, and I talked to one of the residents, one of the parishioners at Pompeii, and he had taken a series of classes at Greenwich House on Barrow Street in furniture making and furniture repair and upholstery, and that had led to a career in that field. So he was kind of a craftsperson of furniture. And that was as close as I ever got uh, to someone who had been raised in the neighborhood and followed a, an art or a craft uh, in that field. But here's another example. Uh, on the right is a photograph of Aldo Tambellini, courtesy of his days teaching art at Marymount Manhattan College from 1959 to 1961. To the left is an early work of his on the far left. Uh, uh, a bas relief of the Annunciation. Uh, that's the angel Gabriel on the top of the picture, uh, fingers up raised. You can make out a wing on the angel, and uh, the angel is talking to the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary. She's not got her hands over her ears to not listen to him. That would be really very uh, unorthodox. <laughs> I think she's just sort of in a meditative or prayerful position. I don't think she's trying not to listen to him, uh, but the angel's telling her that she is going to become the mother of God. And uh, in the middle of the picture is a, a, a work that actually came fairly soon after that bas relief. Within a few years, Tambellini had moved from doing these very traditional pictures to doing these explorations of electronic media. Tambellini was born in Syracuse in New York in 1930, um, but his parents separated very soon after his birth and his father moved back to Italy to uh, Lucca in Tuscany. And it was 1930, so they got caught behind the fascist dictatorship. And then they got caught behind World War II. And um, he wasn't able to claim his birthright as a citizen of the United States until 1946. Then he came back to the United States in 1946 and he was able to return. He went to Syracuse where he had been born and where his parents had lived before the divorce. And he was able to pick up some threads of, of uh, people he knew there, people his family knew there. He uh, attended Syracuse University, got a BFA there, and then he got an MFA from Notre Dame uh, in Indiana. And then he moved to the Lower East Side and spent the rest of his life uh, there. Uh, he remained active in the counterculture. He was a pioneer in this kind of mixture of different kinds of art, including electronic media. And I'm sorry, I, I can't like make that happen for you. You will have to visit his website. Uh, he passed away in, in 2020, but the website's still active. There's the website uh, uh, URL. Uh, you're welcome to go see how all this stuff works. I, um, and I think you have the potential to realize this can be a very far reaching topic and we could do other things besides the visual arts that there would be Italian Americans who would grow up with an interest in music or in theater or in you know one of the other performing and creative arts or in pop. And we could perhaps look for many other people as well as in the arts. A third form of interaction, the idea that there just be two parallel cultures, if you will, is symbolized by this business card found among the papers of Our Lady of Pompeii and pinned, that's a, a, a little pin on the top there on the left. It's the business card of Donatus Bongiorno who identifies his skills as religious mural painting, church artistic decoration and historical productions. Actually his skills were pretty much whatever the client would want him to be. It was accompanied by the artist's Italian language, two page, handwritten version of a cold call, introducing himself, 
and announcing his availability for anything the pastor at Our Lady of Pompeii had in mind. Unfortunately, the pastor didn't have anything in mind, and when this letter arrived in the 19-teens, wasn't in a position to have anything, 1913, excuse me, sort of on the eve of World War I, wasn't in a position to have anything in mind. Um, but to get back, uh, excuse me, uh, wasn't in a position to have anything in mind. But the documents do represent something. Most Italians did come to New York as unskilled laborers. I think everybody knows that. However, there was a layer of people, men and women, who trained in the arts and crafts in Italy, but the Italian economy couldn't absorb all the people educated in these fields. And so some left to try their hand elsewhere. We're most familiar with the, uh, the men's art and craft work in the old mosaic signs in our subway system. Those mosaicists would have learned those arts in Italy and just, I mean, Italy just didn't need that many mosaicists. New York was building a subway system and needed mosaicists. And so we were the lucky winners of all of that skill. Don't worry about Mr. Bongiorno. He had a long and busy career that included decorating the Church of the Most Precious Blood at 113 Baxter Street here in the city. And if you can expand your preservation activities a few blocks south of Canal to the old Five Points area where his church is, that would be greatly appreciated. But to get back to the village, what I want to argue is the Italians presented a kind of counter to the art the village is really famous for. If the 1910s Bohemians and the post-World War II abstract expressionists presented art for art's sake, the Italians presented art for two of the most traditional reasons. And yeah, those colors are pretty lively, aren't they? First, art was a craft. Artists weren't showing off their vision so much as their ability to execute that vision, to get something done, you know, neatly and expertly and perfectly and so it looked right and it was good and so forth um this meant that artists didn't just create new objects like mr bongiorno who you know painted murals and so forth they were also people who kept the old objects going palazzo and imperatrice bookbinders did create new book covers but they also rebound the missal, the priests at our church of Our Lady of Pompeii used for mass, and apparently did some repairs on another book uh, for Pompeii. And for this, I got to thank uh, uh, the pastor, who was something of a pack rat and saved all the receipts. And I mean, 1897 to 1933. Second, art wasn't just self-expression. It was the community using familiar symbols to communicate itself to itself and you know, people looking at things that were familiar and kind of reinforcing you know, their own story and to outsiders, to visitors who might come by and to future generations. This is how children were inculcated into the, into, you know, because they're, they're you know, in, inculcated into the community. Um, it can seem a little abstract um, because th this mural was put together to mean something to the parish of Our Lady of Pompeii, and we may have lost some of the meaning over the years, like, you know, what's that doing in the picture? So let's put the picture back together here. The original artist was Antonio, Antonio, excuse me, Antonio D'Ambrosio, founder of the D'Ambrosio Ecclesiastical Art Company. Antonio D'Ambrosio was born and educated for an art career in Italy, doing just what you see here. But Italy was producing more artists than it could use, whereas the United States was still building and decorating churches, um, although not as fast as we would hope. Uh, this church was built in the 1920s, a dedicated 1928, but it couldn't be decorated then because of the Great Depression. It, it stood 
without decoration for some years. And then in the 1930s, um, the parishioners began to sign up to pay for different little parts of the decorations. And there's actually a, a book still in the in the archives. Um, the, uh, the pastor at that time was no longer Father Damo, it was another man named Giovanni Marcagiani, uh, kept um, where he had a kind of layaway plan where the parishioners signed up uh, for stained glass windows, which were quite expensive. And they would put money down and put money down and put money down. And finally, they'd finish paying and they could. The, he would authorize the construction of the stained glass window. I'm not quite sure how this was paid for. I don't have a, uh, a record here. But uh, what I was really here to talk about was how this thing is put together. Uh, Antonio followed his brother, who was trained as an artist, to the Bronx, worked for him until he learned enough about the business and enough English to strike out on his own. And in, he designed this mural. And in the mural, at the top, is the story of how the rosary became a prayer in the Catholic Church. There's the Blessed Mother in the red and blue and the Christ child on her knee and the Christ child's holding a little bouquet. And the Blessed Mother is giving the rosary to Saint Dominic in the black and white, the founder of the Dominican order, and to Saint Catherine of Siena, also in the black and white, although she's not actually getting a rosary um, in other uh ways of showing this picture, the Christ child is handing her a rosary, a kind of symmetrical arrangement. Uh, St. Catherine is a medieval woman of great influence, including a, being a pioneer in Dominican women's communities, of which there are several. Um, the sailing vessel on the lower, to make it a little triangle here, if you look down on the right side, there's a sailing vessel, and that represents the Battle of Lepanto an encounter between the Catholic forces of the Western Mediterranean, that would be where the Italian peninsula is today, and Spain and Portugal, um, and the Ottoman Empire, and that's on the eastern side where Turkey is, and it took place uh, in the Gulf of Patras in the western part of Greece, October 7th, 1571. Catholics among you may know that October is a month dedicated to the rosary. Now you know why. Uh, Catholic forces won and credited their victory to their praying of the rosary. So that's the connection between the rosary at the top and the little boat on the right. Angels fill the middle of the mural. Uh, at the bottom right, we see the Campanile or bell tower of Our Lady of Pompeii. And across Across the bottom are some stylized immigrants in kind of biblical dress being assisted by a variety of people. There's a Franciscan upright. Um, he's got some, uh, he's got a brown Franciscan outfit on and the tonsure, the kind of little round hairdo with the bald spot on the top of Franciscans. And he's handing a rosary uh, to somebody. Uh, the Franciscans are first on the ground in the village, having founded St. Anthony of Padua in 1866, so that's how come they get so honored. Behind him is St. Martin of Pours. St. Martin is there as a representative of the African-American community that lived in the village before the Italians moved in. Uh, it's the African-Americans Catholic Church, St. Benedict the Moor, that the Italians purchased and turned into Our Lady of Pompeii. That's the church that was, excuse me, <laughs> that stood where um, Sixth Avenue now crosses Blinker, the church that was demolished. Um, the next recognizable figure is the one with the gold mitre that's the kind of pointy hat. Um, and that is St. John Baptist Scalabrini. It feels good to say that he became a saint last October. And you can see the Bishop Mitre too, the kind of curly Q uh, staff that he's carrying, a, a kind of a stylized Bishop Shepherd, a shepherd's crook. Um, uh, Scalabrini founded the order that staffs Pompeii today. Behind him or next to him is a figure in a red, uh, um, red robe. That is St. Charles Borromeo whom Scalabrini chose as the patron saint for his community. He didn't name it the Scalabrinians. He was more modest. They took the name in, 19, in the 1970s uh, when Vatican II asked them to update their, their community. 
Um, St. Charles is shown doing something that he did during his lifetime back in the 17th century, caring for a plague victim. Finally, there is Christ. That's the person with the arms upraised down there. Uh, shepherding people away from purgatory he's got his back turned towards purgatory with the fire on the left and towards heavenly glory um, sort of upward and then there is a dog with a um a, a, a torch that is the symbol of the dominicans they're loyal 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 to the church loyal to the pope etc etc and so forth so that like i say it's a little sort of in a sense, almost abstract, like what are they doing there? What are they doing in this combination? But the picture represents all these different little symbols that, again, would have explained one by one to people, well, this is a little bit of who we are. This person, this thing means this to us, this means that to us. Mr. D'Ambrosio, Antonio D'Ambrosio, died in a fall from scaffolding in 1951. His family continues his business, though, to this day. In 1985, this uh, uh, this mural that you see here was reworked, um, and the image of Scalabrini was added, actually, at that point, and also the one of St. Martin de Porres was added. These, those were added. Uh, the pastor of Pompeii at the time was Father Charles Zanoni, and he was the one that suggested that those two be added. So I think that... Um, there might have it might have made a little more sense if we knew who the I don't actually know who the original figures were. Um, I think if I did, I have never seen what the original mural. I don't have a picture of the original mural. Uh, if I did, I might be able to just tell you what um, you know what like the dog is doing there and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, the D'Ambrosio family is sort of an American success story. An immigrant came from with minimal resources and by hard work built up a multi-generational family business that now operates far and beyond the Italian and Catholic communities in which it started. You can go to their website, look at their catalog, see all the different places where they maintain um, uh, buildings with all things that look very much like Pompeii. Um, it's harder to trace the individual fortunes of artists such as G. Fecorotta, who ran a photography studio and whose photos show up on eBay and related websites. Although this photo comes from Father Demo's file, as it seems his parishioner gave him a photo of her in some kind of fancy dress, uh, definitely not first communion gear. I don't know if it's a prom outfit of some sort, um, but the point here is to say what the arts meant to Italian American craft oriented artists who operated at the same time as John Sloan and William and Marguerite Zorak and Robert Henry. They were artists in the sense of learning technique and in, lear in learning a symbolic vocabulary and in, in applying their own creativity to getting a project done, done well, done so that people would know, yeah, that's what it looks like. It looks, looks right, that sort of thing. Um, it was just that the economics of their position dictated that they usually have customers lined up. And although the uh, although the aforementioned Donatus Buongiorno also traveled back to Italy and did genre paintings, which he sold to American tourists looking for souvenirs of their grand tours. So in that sense, members of the Italian artistic community could also pursue strategies like some of those of the better known it, uh, village artistic communities. Before we leave this aspect of Italian support for the arts, a word about the performing arts. And first, the one real indulgence, because I'm sure this is hard to look at, and don't don't try to read it. If you want, I'll go back and read it for you, or if, if somebody says they want it read, I'll read it for you. Um, it's a favorite document of mine um, from Father Damo. One day, probably sometime in the 19 teens, a young woman parishioner named Providenza left surreptitiously with a traveling theatrical troupe that had been performing in the village. Her parents wanted her to come home. 
However, there seems to have been a communications gap. I know from other correspondence in Father Demos' file that there were families that could not communicate in writing. Parents couldn't write English and offspring couldn't read Italian. Father Demo worked his connections, including the Ida Ravani who had given him that photo you saw in the previous slide. Ida gave him uh, Providenza's address where she was staying with the theatrical troupe in Washington, DC. And Father Demo, for whom English was a second language, practiced what he wanted to say. It's not clear he sent this letter or what happened afterwards, but it's just a wonderful expression of concern for a parishioner that he understood must have found the theater so much uh, bright light, so much more, so much more interesting than what was going on at home, that this was, was a whole nother world. And again, just, you know, a couple of blocks away, there's the province template house. A couple of blocks away, something else is happening. A couple of blocks away. And what does he have to compare with it? Well, he tried. <laughs> like many parishes, Pompeii had its own theatrical program. Unlike many, between 1923 and 1934, it had an ambitious passion play. This was kind of an unusual, unusual one. Uh, most, most of the parish theatricals were either sort of variety shows with like different kinds of talent or oddly enough, minstrel shows. They sort of caught on to that uh, idea. Um, although Pompeii, as far as I know, didn't have that. Um, um, or, um, or actually, or straight plays. I mean, they did put on straight plays. The Passion Play was actually a series of tableau, a living stations of the cross, but with fewer scenes, nine instead of the traditional 14 stations of the cross. The cast drew from professional performers. Uh, someone, a professional played the Christ and um, Judas dedicated parishioners and parish societies whose members joined in crowd scenes. The performers arranged themselves behind a curtain. The curtain would open. The parish organist, at that time Giovanni Battista Fontana, who had trained at the Scuola de Musica in Cremona, and his star pupil, Anna Carbone, later Anna Carbone La Padula, played appropriate organ music, while the actors, or piano music, while the actors held their poses and the audience looked on reverently. The audience was, as the stage manager occasionally had to remind them, not supposed to applaud. Uh, as the musical piece ended, the curtain closed and the actors posed for the next scene. This is a postcard of Father Demo with some of the parishioner actors in costume. Until it became too noticeable that she was indeed a young woman, Parishioner Conchetta Molica, uh, on the left, the one whose hair is a natural color, played St. John, the youngest disciple and eventual evangelist. The other woman on Father Demo's left, was the one with the veil over her head, um, was another frequent correspondent of his, Antoinetta Scagni, who played the Blessed Mother. Uh, given the actors were, uh, most of the actors were amateurs, the professionalism in the play seems to have derived in part from hiring professional director and stage manager Luigi Raybout, seen here in a photo he autographed for Father Demo. Mr. Raybout also played uh, the passion plays Judas Iscariot. I haven't been able to find a biography for Mr. Raybout, but there are plenty of scanned documents in small local collections, going all the way down to Florida, indicating he acted as director or stage manager or theater manager for performances and theaters of various sizes all up and down the East Coast. It might be possible to put together at least a timeline of his American career. My bigger point is this, just like the parallel between the avant-garde and experimental artists in the better known village community and the more artisan and craft-like approach in the Italian-American community, their parallel histories 
alongside the experimental community theater of the Provincetown Players, there's this passion play. There's a lot of theater going on here that maybe we ought to be looking at. Finally, I want to argue the Italian immigrants found in the village an economic situation they could leverage to their advantage. Their path to economic security created a situation that allowed creative communities to flourish in their midst. This is a more elaborate argument than the previous three. You probably all know the facts I'm going to present for the next few minutes. I'm just asking you to put them together in a different way. Let's start with this familiar fact. We're looking at the area whose topography is formed by Mineta Creek, starting in two branches in the 20s, just west of Broadway, and heading southwest to the Hudson River below Canal Street. The only problem is the map is tipped at a 45 degree angle. So instead of going south, it appears to be going north. Um, the presence of the flowing water meant that until recently, it was difficult to get down to the bedrock to anchor tall buildings. When Greenwich Village and what's now South Village developed into residential areas, in a time period from the 1790s to the 1810s, they were built up with Federalist style construction, seen here along MacDougall Street between Washington Square South and West Third. I think it's a very familiar row for most people. The, in a second spurt of development, and this is pretty far from our South Village, I'm afraid it's on the other side of Washington Square Park, the village got the row of Greek revival houses along Washington Square North. There's other surviving Greek revival homes here and there in the area. Uh, in some places, the village got tenements, although these examples are from further east. But the important thing is that even the majority of tenements are built on relatively small footprints. Okay, now we want to concentrate on the fact that most Italian men were unskilled. They still did marvelous work. We still use the subway they built. This is one of my favorite pictures of the subway. It's from a book called Gli Italiani negli Stati Uniti d'America. Uh, they didn't get paid very much for their work. In the early years, the men tended to leave their families in Italy. After World War I, though, more and more opted to relocate the family in the United States, which ended up turning the whole family into wage earners. Uh, in the village, Louise C. Odenkrantz, a sociologist working out of Richmond Hill House, at a settlement at 23 MacDougall Street on the northeast corner of Washington Square Park, surveyed the area's Italian women in the 1910s. She established that the most common paid labor was artificial flower making in a factory or at home. That meant that men like Paolo Campo Menosi, seen here at his business at 542, 544 West Broadway, um, it seems to be between West Third and Bleecker, where LaGuardia places today, hired women to assemble flowers at his silk import shop and also gave out bundles of material which were returned to him as finished product. So this is an even better picture. The Alpi brothers, and they're all from the same book. It's called, again, Gli Italiani negli Stati Uniti d'America. It was a product of something called the Italian Chamber of Commerce, which was actually a, a New York-based agency. A lot of uh, Italian-speaking people, business uh, entrepreneurs, uh, kicked in to put this thing together. Uh, and they all, because they kicked in to put it together, they all got a page to describe their businesses. It's a fascinating book, and the village is well represented in it. The Alpi brothers of 69 West Houston hired women to assemble flowers at their silk import warehouse. There they are doing it. It should come as no surprise that the Alpi brothers were donors to that nursery our Lady of Pompeii ran for the children of working mothers. Uh, Louise Odenkrantz produced very detailed tables, not only on the women, but on how their work affected their whole families. And here you can see that the tables are difficult to reproduce on the slides. So I've pulled, I just gave you a little taste of what the typing looks like up there. So I've pulled one line of statistics from table 30, which is based on a survey of how 48 families in the study spent their income. 
Odenkrantz tracked four items, rent, which was pretty nearly non-negotiable, food, fuel, and light, which sort of came together, uh, and um, life insurance, which would have paid for the funerals of families not enrolled in mutual benefit societies, because after all, the death rate here was inescapable. Um, you can probably think of a lot to do with what Odenkrantz considers a 35% margin for other purchases. A family of 6.8 people must have had 4.8 children or 5.8 children, requiring at least some clothing purchases to accommodate wear and tear and growth, especially for that 0.8 child there. Um, or perhaps the family had a piano on layaway. You use your imagination. However, it's clear that the family might have had some margin for savings. Where did they put their savings? The Italian village had bankers. This is one of them, Luigi Fugazi. However, Mr. Fugazi's idea of being a banker was helping people send money back to Italy. He didn't spend a lot of time on the small investor the way that if you go to a city bank or a, a Chase bank or a TD or anything today, there's some little part of the bank uh, where it says stuff like not FDI and C insured. Um, and there's people to you know help you uh, deal with sums of money. There's no such thing back then. Uh, so Italian immigrants are gonna be looking at real estate and the nice thing about the village is the real estate is small. It's that, the, like I said, those small footprints, is little Federalist, little Great Revival, even a tenement is, is a small size. It's purchasable, down payment, mortgage, all of this stuff is doable. Um, and uh, even when, when these people are still not quite like done with their work years, they could move from being uh, employed by others to employing themselves, to buying something and starting, you know, going into a small business, a bar, a candy store, a, you know, a, a tobacco shop, a, a little grocery, stuff like the lunch counter, stuff like that. Um, uh, if they were older, they might, might indeed have the money to put down the money, purchase a tenement. They might if they still had some energy, be their own uh, a custodian, or they might have to make a deal with one of the tenants in the place, but they'd be moving, trying to put their money into real estate, essentially. How do I know any of this? My first clue was a negative one. When I studied urban history with Ken Jackson at Columbia University, okay, I promise to stop the name dropping. The hot new book was Thomas Kessner's The Golden Door a careful statistical study which proved that during the period of mass migration, you can see the 1880 to 1915 up in the title, um, Italians didn't get far up the educational ladder the way Jewish people did. Fine, but by the time I read the book, which was not 1880 to 1915, okay, the Italians had achieved some economic security. How did that happen? My first clue, came when I attended an exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York and saw a photograph of the interior of an early Italian restaurant with this caption. The Cafe Bertolotti on West 3rd Street was among the most popular of the Backstreet Bistros. This exhibit was on precisely what I'm talking about here, the kind of interaction between Italians and the the performing and creative arts crowd that settled amongst them. Um, we, well into the teens, Signora Bertolotti, affectionately known as Mama, served a famous lunch of thick minestrone soup, bread and butter, and red wine for 15 cents, tip included. Those who couldn't pay were often fed on the house. I ran into the Bertolotti family in the records of Our Lady of Pompeii where they were known as people other than restaurateurs to bohemian celebrities. Emma Bertolotti, one of the daughters of the family, had a vocation to religious life 
and corresponded with Pompey's clergy about it. This is a carbon of the letter that the pastor sent to the convent that Emma Bertolotti planned to enter, certifying you know, that she was free to enter this convent, that she hadn't contracted a marriage, wasn't uh, you know, already promised to do something else. She was free to enter the convent, so forth. That's what it says. It's in Italian, okay? Um, and the, you can see Bertolotti underlined in blue. Father Demo used this sort of blue wax pencil to note the important things so he knew how to file his correspondence. Um, so what happens here? The Bertolotti family were parishioners as well. And, and they so they had this parish life. They went to church. They were contributors to the church. And their family attended the church. And one of them happened to grow up to want to become a sister and, and want to enter a convent in Rome. That was seemed to be her where she what her preference was, what her her vocation is the way the the the, the sort of the formal language for speaking about these things. And um, but they also had to earn a living. And so, uh, and they, and apparently there wasn't, after a while, a father in the family. So Mrs. Bertolotti uh, had this restaurant, and I don't know if her husband had started it and she took it over. That part I, I couldn't get from the records. And, um, but she could work from home. She could take care of her kids and her, you know, and, and be a breadwinner and a housekeeper, if you will. And uh, so she could live, you know, basically in a couple of worlds at once this way. So it was a very, very kind of a nice arrangement. And she then had this connection to this other world because, you know, she needed customers. She just, and she wasn't picky about who the customers were, uh, whether they were her fellow Italians. Um, and for, you know, that was why she was serving Italian food. Um, or there were these other people who appreciated a cheap meal too, these artists and these other people. Through the research, the, throughout the research in parish history, the clues multiplied. I found that in 1967, the Scalabrini fathers who staffed the parish decided to put their provincial headquarters next door to the parish rectory. One factor in that decision may have been the building they wanted to purchase was owned by the man in the light colored tie standing behind a uh, father demo who is sitting behind the american flag in this picture that's john a Parazzo. mr Parazzo was a career employee at the post office which some of you know the um on uh, seventh avenue varick street there um it provided him with a lifetime of steady employment, steady paycheck. This was how he was able to earn money for his family and then set aside money to, um, you know, buy, which, buy real estate, which he did. He, he owned several properties, one on Leroy Street and one on Carmine Street. He was also a lifetime parishioner, a head usher and holy name man. And so when it came time to sell his property, he looked favorably on the Scalabrinians. It was a win-win. They got a place for their provincial headquarters. He got a lump sum to use to take care of himself in his old age. Later, I read Ross Wettstein's Republic of Dreams, which some of you may also have read. One chapter is on the Provincetown players. When it came to the place the Provincetown players used, this picture comes from the village preservation. Wettstein identified the address, 139 MacDougall, and called the owner, Jenny Bellardi, someone who, quote, had once thought of herself as an actress, but who, anticipating the careers of so many villagers, had turned to real estate instead, end quote. Uh, the New York Times article from June 2nd, 1940, um, add some detail. That, by the way, is not Mrs. Bellardi in the picture. That's Mitzi Gaynor. I had some trouble getting the article to cut out properly, and uh, that picture belongs to another article that's nearby. Um, sorry about that, but on to Mrs. Bellardi. She was born Jenny Ferrari. Uh, she had a sister, Mary, who grew up to become Mary Conti and to move to Bell Harbor on Long Island, leaving uh, Jenny in the city. Their mother ran a grocery store, variously located on South Fifth Avenue, on Worcester Street, and on Green Street. 
And she was the one who first plowed the profits from the grocery store into real estate, um, uh, buying a haberdashery on Mill at the Mills Hotel on Bleecker Street. And her daughters took that haberdashery when they grew up. They that's what became their store. That's where they earned their living when they were very when they were starting out as young adults. Then they got married. Mrs. Bellardi stayed in the town. Mrs. Conti moved out of town. Mrs. Bellardi stayed with the business. And then as they earned money, they plowed it into real estate and they bought a string of properties along MacDougall, which included this property that became the Provincetown Playhouse. And it was Mrs. Bellardi who was acted as the rental agent, the one who decided who they were going to rent to. And she was the one who chose the Provincetown players as, as their renters. And she found them the most businesslike of the theater groups that she dealt with. And she ended up dealing with quite a few of them after the Provincetown players dissolved in 1922, because she'd had a decent experience with them. They paid their bills and so forth. So she rented to some other theater groups, but she had a lot of trouble with them, uh, both you know having them keep the property in good order and having them pay their bills. And the, the problems were exacerbated when the Great Depression started and everybody had trouble paying their bills. And then uh, in, by 1940, the state Supreme Court appointed a receiver for the property who was gonna auction it off and use the money to pay the outstanding bills and back taxes on the property. So Mrs. Bellardi ended up losing it. By the time I read Mrs. Bellardi's story, I was beginning to see a pattern of a you know, situation where there are Italian Americans who put their money in real estate, sometimes successfully, okay, sometimes not, but their customers, their either at their restaurant, as their tenants, are not just their fellow Italians. Their customers can include people in the performing and creating creative arts. And by the time I read Mrs. Bellardi's story, I'm beginning to see a pattern. And so I was ready to notice it the next time I saw a story. And that was when I read David Hajdu's Positively Fourth Street. And this is a leap in time forward to 1960. The area still has Italians because, again, they're purchasing real estate and it's small scale real estate. You know, they can they can survive uh, even though they're struggling. And one of our strugglers is a man named Mike Corco, who owned a restaurant, Gertie's, and he is serving uh, people who have lunch or dinner because they work in factories in the loft buildings nearby except that after World War II, those loft buildings begin to empty out, and so does his restaurant. Well, then he gets a visit from a young folk, a young, a young man named Izzy Young, and Young has a proposal for him that they remake the restaurant's evening menu or evening experience or whatever you want to call the evening as a, um, a coffee house. So instead of you know serving an evening menu, They'll have lighter fare. They'll have music. Izzy will book the acts. Michael serve. They'll split the results and so forth. And so they went ahead and did that, and it worked out. And <clears throat> excuse me. In fact, it worked out so well that within a short time. Mike Porco realized he might be able to get a better booker than Izzy Young. And he moved on to get a new booker who got him Bob Dylan. When Dylan first appeared in the Greenwich Village Circuit, he had his very own Italian American supporter of the arts, Susie Rutolo. A visual artist herself, Rotolo was a red diaper baby who'd worked for progressive causes and interested Dylan in them to some extent. She was a, also a voracious reader. It was their common interest in literature that sort of intersected with the rest of their relationship and helped develop Dylan's music and help kind of keep their relationship going 
for as long as it did. She eventually left him to pursue some of her other causes. It's sort of her immediate cause at the time was mm, she was going to visit Cuba. Um, she continued to live in the village long after he went on to other things. I need to strengthen that particular argument about real estate systematically. Right now, what I have is evidence as to why the system ended. Italian migration ended. There wasn't a new immigrant group that also invested in real estate to secure its future. Consumer banking began to offer people many more options as a way to you know, protect their economic security. And also real estate prices, even on the small plots in the village, push prices past what a modest investor could consider. So what was left were just signs the Italians had been there, such as a statue of Garibaldi in Washington Square. If you all think these theories, you know, the idea of inspiration, the idea of integration, the idea that we've got two parallel cultures, both of which need some exploration, or the idea that there's some symbiosis. Need if, if any of those ideas appeal to you and you think they ought to be explored, let me know how to prioritize them. Let me know about exploring them. Um, I think it's important, especially that, that last one, because it might help us understand a time when the economy was on a scale that allowed individuals to make the kinds of decisions that would really allow these opportunities in this neighborhood. Thank you. A nice bouquet from Washington Square Park for the audience. If you have something to say that you don't get to say during the question period that's gonna open up in the next minute, uh, you can see my email address up there on the screen. Um, I hope to join the audience again soon. This is, I mean, I wanted to do this because you are a highly respected audience. I hope you know that. And I look forward uh, to uh, joining you again and to hearing from some other fantastic speakers in um, uh, the series of talks that Village Preservation puts on. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and be able to, uh, I hope, take questions or at least hear from people's comments. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That was an incredible presentation. So yeah, we have a couple of questions here. So we have one, what kind of relationship did the drama folks at Pompeii have possibly with Greenwich House on Barrow Street, which had its own theater department? Uh, I'm sorry, I have a cold and my breathing is irregular. I'm sorry about that little blip there. That is a really good question. Um, there is core, I've not seen the archives for Greenwich House on that subject. Um, I've seen the archives at Pompeii because they corresponded. They would, um, Greenwich House sent out, at least in the, teens and 20s i gotta ask you when did the theater at, at greenwich house get its start do you know i do not know off the top of my head okay um i don't know either um i know when the because i know it started with a lot of different kinds of arts programs they were doing pottery they were doing um because they would have these exhibits and they would send a, a little note to pompeii come see our exhibit or can we borrow your slide projector we're going to have something you know, they would send these little notes around. So I don't know exactly when the theater program got going. So I'd have to know that to answer part of the question. Um, so in fact, I have to know that to answer the question. That would be one thing. Um, so I haven't seen anything in Pompeii's archives, which are really good up through the 30s. Father Damo died in 1936. And his successor wasn't as good at keeping records. So after that, it gets really uh, dicey uh, as to what, what was going on. Um, um, 
as you were doing the research on all of this, did you come across any other immigrant groups that had kind of a similar trajectory in the, the in the same way that the Italians did with with purchasing property, real estate, and then it being kind of related to supporting the arts? No, and that was what was so interesting. When I was a, a young graduate student, the Italians were always kind of the outliers. They were always like the people that didn't quite make it, which was silly because, of course, when I was, I, I was a little, a little graduate student, a little before Mario Cuomo became governor. But, you know, um, it wasn't like these people were, were not, uh, uh, making it. I mean, Lee Iacocca was already, you know, already at, at Chrysler, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, but everyone was, you know, look at, look at the Jewish communities moved up in education, the Irish community and, and moved up in politics. Everyone could identify their, those strategies for success. And I think people just had trouble identifying an Italian strategy for success. And that, you know, if, if that means anything. Um, and those are sort of the really big groups in the city. Okay, so that's another, another issue. Um, when it comes to your next big, you know, large group, say Dominicans, you're talking about a group that is very recent. So we're going to have to also talk about having to have the proper time frame before we can say, okay, what's the strategy for success here? Um, because you've got to give that strategy time to work properly and, and time to see, you know, how, how it works. Um, you know, and, and, and be able to talk about it. Um, in, in general, you know, every other group, I guess the other big group would be Germans. And they're sort of bigger than we think they are because, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, they come through early German migration starts early and, and, um, it suffers a, a bit of forced assimilation in World War One. It, it it just sort of gets uh, dissipated in World War One, um, and it's hard to begin to track it. Um, and why do you think versus the other groups, the Italians took this particular route to to help? keep, you know, raise themselves up e economically? A um, couple of reasons. First, and I, I hope it was clear that it was there to do. The village made it possible. The The real estate was there. It's, it's, um, it, it, the prices for housing prior to say the 1920s, 1930, even into the 1930s and 40s, you can put down a, a couple of thousand dollars and get yourself started towards owning some real estate. You can uh, get a, a mortgage with a very reasonable percentage interest rate. Um, you can manage these things. You can, you can get, uh, uh, you can manage these things. So it's there to do. The village sort of makes that possible um, because the, the real estate is, you know, you're talking about something that's about 20 feet by a hundred feet. You're not talking about buying a great big block of, you know, great big block of, of, of space. Um, so that's one reason. Um, the other reason is they come by the money in kind of the, like the proper amounts, like there'll be chunks of money, 
you know, saved up money. And then, and then it's a matter of paying off a mortgage, which means, you know, money coming in, money going out, money coming in, money going out. Um, so they come by the money the right way. They, they, they can budget it in. Um, whereas if you want to advance, say by becoming a doctor or by becoming a, a, a professional, you've got to make an investment in education that requires, you know, certain kinds of planning that that's hard to do, you yeah. know, with the budgeting that they've got to do. Did I, does that make sense? I hope. No, absolutely. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, we have another question. Uh, curious if you know what regions in Italy were most of the cafe owners in the neighborhood from? Oh, uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, much of the earliest settlement in the South Village was from Northern Italy. Um, and this was a pattern that's repeated in different parts of the United States. It gets later, it gets, you know, it shifts from shifts from Northern Italy to Southern Italy. Um, okay, and, and when I say earliest, I'm talking like the 1870s, Italy becomes a united country, becomes the kingdom of Italy, becomes the kingdom of Italy in 1861, it's proclaimed the kingdom of Italy. In 1861, it, it becomes a completely united Italy in 18, 1870, 71, with the, the, the unification of Southern Italy, and Southern Italy is added in. And um, by then, the Northern Italians are beginning to realize that there's sort of a downside to, the, to unification because the uh, leadership not only wants unification, they not only want to be the kingdom of Italy, they want to be one of the great powers of Europe. And if you want to be one of the great powers of Europe, it's expensive. You got to tax your population. You got to make the men serve in the military. It's, it's expensive. And the uh, people have to, and the taxes have to be paid in cash, which was in the 19th century. I mean, that sounds so obvious to us because we, we deal with cash for everything. But the 19th century was was sort of shifting over to cash. And um, so what was beginning to happen was people who had been living on farms and eating, you know, eating stuff off the farm and trading stuff that was on the farm for other stuff that was a farm, you know, all of a sudden start, starts to have to deal with farms. So I have to still start to deal with earning money for cash. And first the men, and, and, and that's one reason why it's a men, the men, the men do the migrating, the women sort of hang, hang, stay at the farm or stay at the, at their homestead. Cause the men go out and they earn cash. They earn, they earn money as um, extra hands on other people's uh, agricultural ventures. And they go in, in uh, further and further abroad uh, looking for work uh, until they're looping around northern Italy, uh, looping around southern France, looping up into Europe, uh, looping up into northern Europe, looping into North Africa. And then, you know, finally that loop begins to go across the Atlantic to the United States. Um, the loop does not loop to South America. When they go there, they're usually going to stay because that's a pretty far distance and they'll be working on they'll be working in agriculture but they'll be working you know on on uh coffee and and uh um in argentina they'll be working you know in, in sometimes in the new cities on in the and in new industries like railroads and stuff like that uh and then they'll be working in the united states and then you know eventually that the long long commute <laughs> is such that why don't i just bring the family over here because <laughs> And and we'll just just become a just 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 settle here, and World War One helps them make that decision. There are places where it's um, you know, Italy 
Italy, Italy was a winner in World War One. Italy was a victorious nation in World War One, but it it uh, paid a tremendous price for that war, uh, and um, it became sort of. Uh, uh, some people decided they were just going to try their luck someplace else. So, um, and at that point, you know, a lot of Southern Italians are being are, by then are joining the joining the migration. Um, you also have to dis. It also, it's where the boat goes from. Uh, Naples, excuse me, Genoa is your first big port of leaving. Um, and Naples is the second big port from which you'll leave, and Palermo is the third. Does that help? Did that help explain things it's well just, enough? It's fascinating all the the how the micro is affected by the macro. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing connections. No, thank you so much. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions right now. So Dr. Brown, a huge thank you for this incredibly fascinating presentation. There's a bunch of thank yous from the folks in the chat. They were really fascinated by this. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for, for joining us this evening and for joining us through programs throughout 2023. So I wanna wish everyone on behalf of Village Preservation and to you, Dr. Brown, a very happy, healthy holiday season. I myself am also recovering from a cold as I bet many others are as well. So I hope everyone gets better quickly and very soon. And I wish everyone a very happy new year and look forward to seeing you and joining for our programs in 2024. Until then, everyone have a great night and a great rest of your year. And oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Can I just ask one quick question? Is sure. there a way to kind of get a list of like who's saying what? Sure, yes, I'll be I'll be able to send that to you. Okay. That's that's great. I mean, um, I'm sorry, I kind of made it might have kind of overwhelmed them with, you know, talk. <laughs> no, absolutely. It was all fascinating. Everyone was was super pleased with it. So thank you so much again. Well, I'm glad it worked. I'm glad it worked. I I was uh, I I I will will see what else I can do because I I find it interesting. I have some I have a book I'm supposed to be working on with the Scalabrini fathers, but we will we'll be able to, you know, um start writing what I want to write, you know, sooner, soon, and hopefully be able to follow up on some of these ideas. Um, Absolutely. You know, very yeah. I know someone, I know someone is working on a book on Aldo Tambellini, by the way. That's how I even found out he existed with somebody called Marymount and said, do you have any, can you confirm this? And I like, because I worked at Marymount's archives and I was like, sure. Okay. I'll check on it. And there he is. And it's like, oh, um, you know, so I uh, that I know someone's working on a book on Aldo Tambellini. I don't know, you know, when that's coming out or anything like that, but you'll have to watch for it. No, uh, no, cause... we'll be able to look out for that and we'll be able to look out for, for when you start publishing something again and have you back here to join yeah. us for another presentation. Yeah. Well, keep it keep in mind and and keep in mind again. I'd be happy to redo you know some of the theater stuff if there's anything that you think would be helpful. And if I can think of any way to work in what we do with the refugees, I've been looking to see if any of the addresses would sync up with anything in the in the village, um, uh, except for the Saint Raphael Society, which I know does, but we have these world war ii era uh records as well and i know that they operated out of a, a an office on 14th street and i've been trying to kind of figure out like what do they even actually do um and see if that would be helpful to anybody absolutely but, a lot uh, of fascinating yeah. things to still look into yeah but we'll let you know awesome well, thank you again. And yeah, happy holidays and a very happy new year. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll talk right. to you. I'm it going better. to leave. I'm going to leave now and get something to drink and blow my nose. <laughs>
Please take care. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye.